Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby and welcome back to World of Tanks and today I've got a full tank review for you of the Emil 1951. This tier 8 Swedish premium autoloading heavy tank is the first of its class in the game and it is going to be available worldwide tomorrow with the release of episode 5 in Frontline. Now why is it available for the first time in Frontline tomorrow you might be asking? Well that's because to be able to unlock this tank you need 12 prestige points. And the only opportunity that you had to be able to get 12 prestige points is if you complete episode 7 of Frontline. And obviously with them releasing once every single month and the fact that you can only go two episodes ahead of current episode 5, this is your first opportunity to get the Emil 1951. But just because it's a brand new tank doesn't mean that it's actually going to be any good. So let's compare the vehicle to its standard tier 8 counterpart, the Emil 1, to see if it holds up. Now, the Emil 1951 has received the same kind of changes that the Emil had uh, a couple of patches ago, i.e. its 105mm caliber gun had a single round removed from its magazine, going from 4 to 3, but its alpha damage was increased to 360. This was a great change, considering that the unload time of the Emil did not increase because obviously it was able to get more damage out quicker. Now the Emil 1951 is going to take that to a new level because it actually has an intraclip reload of 2.75 seconds, which is a quarter of a second better than the Emil, which means that it can unload its entire magazine for 1080 damage on average in 5.5 seconds rather than the 6 seconds of the Emil. However, it has 3 seconds extra reload time on that magazine, so the DPM of the tank does go down into a, a rather lackluster territory for any tier 8 vehicle. Thankfully, however, the vehicle carries a whopping amount of ammunition, 75 rounds, so you can take a plethora of regular and premium rounds in this tank, depending on what kind of a matchup you get into, or if you're just wanting to use them in front line. Okay, so now onto the gun handling. One of the worst things about the Emil, and it really holds the vehicle back. Does the Emil 1951 improve upon this? Well, yes, the aim time is fractionally down, down to three seconds, but its accuracy is worse, its dispersion when moving is worse, but its dispersion when moving the turret is better. And this all means that if you're sitting still, as quite often you do do in the Emil, and just re-engage your targets as they're, they're moving right in front of your, your turret, then you are going to have faster aim time. But as soon as you move the tank, it's going to bloom out the reticle and you're going to struggle to be able to get it in as quickly as you would want to. One thing that's fantastic about the Emil 1951, just like the standard tier 8 Swedish heavy tank counterpart, is the gun depression. 12 degrees is absolutely awesome and this is really the reason why you want to play your Swedish autoloading heavy tanks because you can work a ridgeline unlike any other heavy tank can in the game. Alright, moving on. Mo Ability. Is it good news for the Emil 1951? Well, it's slower forwards by 5 km an hour, but it has a nice power to weight ratio increase, which allows this vehicle to feel more mobile up a slope. Now, its traverse speed is actually slightly better, and its tank traverse is better as well. Should I say the turret traverse is slightly better? However, because this is a premium tank and it doesn't have upgradable engines and its ground resistances stay the same, even though its power to weight ratio is a little bit better, its effective traverse speed is, is practically the same, if not a little bit worse than the standard Emil. And Wargaming also have hidden statistics that they don't show you and you're not even available on websites like TanksGG that do affect these kind of things as well. All in all, you should expect the same kind of mobility from the Emil 1951 as you do from the standard Emil. Alright, so now let's talk about the armor of this vehicle. It's very impressive. We're talking about 100 at the front, 35 at the side. This is a very significant change that the Emil received recently, whereas previously it had 20 degrees, sorry, millimeters of armor on the side. Now it has 35, which means that you can side scrape against 105 millimeter caliber guns, but no larger, so don't expect to be bouncing ISs, IS3s, or even some higher tier heavy tanks uh, at all with your side armor. The part of the tank that you will be bouncing with, however, is the turret. The turret on this thing is absolutely awesome. When you're not angling it at all, you still have about 240, 250 millimeters of armor on the front of the tank. However, when you are using your gun depression, your cheeks go up to about 370 millimeters of protection. And the only real weak points that this vehicle has would be above and below the gun. That is actually a little bit concerning. As we can see here, here is the turret of the Emil 1951 and here is the turret of the Emil 1. You can see that the gun is actually significantly lower and there's a larger part here above the gun. 
And when we look on tanks GG, it's looking like this armor is actually only 50 millimeters thick, although I haven't quite confirmed this. But what this definitely means is that when the Emil 1951 peers over a ridge line, it's having to expose a hell of a lot more of its armor than the standard Emil is. It feels a lot more like the beefier Emil too with that regard. Even with a weakness like this, the turret of the Emil 1951 is amazing and I would pretty much expose it to any kind of tank apart from some tier 10 tank destroyers or even tier 10 vehicles firing heat rounds at you. So finally, the vehicle gets a standard 1,400 hit points and 360 meters view range, which is uh, really not very good for a tier 8 vehicle that is not Soviet. And so this means that unless you have an exceptionally skilled crew and you're using to use a premium consumable like coffee with cinnamon buns, you're never really going to get your view range up to a good mark with this tank even with coated optics. And so there's an argument you should probably drop these and use binoculars until you have an excellent crew or you're willing to use these things. Otherwise, you're never really going to be spotting your opponents at long range. And the Emil has such a long aim time anyway that quite often you can sit there on the ridge line with your binoculars activated to be able to spot your opponents at long range. But anyway, that's quite enough of a look in the statistics. Let's see how this thing performs on the battlefield. All right, so let's take the Emil out onto a battle on Siegfried Line in the worst possible scenario. I, aka, having to deal with tier 10 tanks and also with there being a big old artillery. Let me tell you, artillery against Swedish heavy tanks is incredibly annoying. Because obviously the strength of these vehicles is working a ridgeline. You want to get there, you want to use your 12 degrees of gun depression, you want to bait people in shooting your turret armor, which is absolutely fantastic on the tank. And then you want to stay safe or you have a very long reload after hopefully unloading on them on their weak points. And yeah, artillery really shooting you over ridge lines or even just stunning you for long periods of time just feel incredibly awkward on the on the tank. All right, so as you can see, I'm using coated optics. So we've got good view range even on the move here. We're able to spot the Bant Chatillon 25T AP out in the open. And while this tank is clearly stationary, that gives you an idea of the aim time of this vehicle. It is absolutely tragic, and the accuracy is really horrific as well at 0.4. If you've got yourself an Object 430U, you will have an idea of just how bad the accuracy is on this tank. It is not going to snipe very well. It's significantly worse than the standard Emil within that regards. And even though that this vehicle has better aim time at 3 seconds, I guess I'm not using a gun lane drive on the tank, and so that's definitely an option for you. If you don't want to have any kind of view range on this tank and you want to fight in close quarters combat, then maybe that would be the better choice. Oh, lovely magazine. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. Two into the Centurion, 5-1, locking down his tracks, getting some tracking damage, and also finishing the Lorraine. And that is what's beautiful about this new rate of fire on the Emil, and also on the Emil 1951. Now that the vehicle only has three rounds of ammunition, but they deal 360 alpha damage, it reloads the magazine faster, and quite often you don't need the fourth shot, just like I wouldn't need the fourth shot there. The fact that we're able to roll higher on the Centurion with the first two shells, and also the fact that this vehicle unloads faster than the standard Emil, meant that we just did more damage. Now we whiffed our first shot against the Lerva's lower plate there, and yeah, I just really want to give you guys an idea of the gun handling. And keep in mind, this is my crew from the Kranfang. They have five skills. This is me using a premium consumable. I'm not using any bond equipment or anything. But hopefully it will give you an idea that, yeah, the gun handling on this tank, it's definitely not going to be snapping any shots in. Unless you're practically stationary on a ridge line, yeah, you're going to be aiming for a long period of time. And the damage per minute on this vehicle, considering it is significantly lower than the standard mill, oh yeah, it does feel a little bit awkward, I'm not going to lie. I've, I've played a lot of games in this tank today, i played about 10 games, they all went pretty well, I ended up with about a 75% win ratio in the tank, and I definitely think it can be very influential in the battle. But I also feel that it just doesn't quite get the damage out sometimes quick enough to be able to, to grind down your opponents as fast as you would want to in a game where your team are clearly winning very quickly. However, this is just wonderful for this vehicle. You kind of have all of the turret armor to be able to have the faith to bait. And, but, oh dear. None of the top, top armor, apparently. An artillery shell right through the top of my tank, creating a big old hole there. Oh my lord, doing 1,057 damage and stunning me for what is practically 30 seconds. And as I don't have my medkit back in... I'm unable to get the rounds back into the tank quickly. Incredibly awkward, and look at that pineapple of a reticle in the middle of our screen right now while we're stunned. We don't want to shoot at the T-49. We're going to try and put one through the side of the Tiger II's armor there. Try and put one through the top of his tank. 
And the artillery is reloaded again. Oh my word, that is rather unfortunate. But still, within the first four minutes of this game, 2,700 damage, 2,000 spotting in the worst possible matchup. But I just want to show you how vulnerable these things are to artillery. Sure, you've got big angled armor on the front of the turret, and your hull isn't a disaster, although it's definitely not very good. But just artillery just... Oh, it just it drives me insane while I'm playing these Swedish heavy tanks. It really does. And also in this game, I wanted to show you that even though we were pretty much permanently firing throughout the game, the tank just doesn't have that raw DPM to, to really rack up some huge scores, uh, at least in fast games like this. Nevertheless, when you're dealing with tanks which are higher tier than you, you really don't have to achieve much to be able to get big experience scores with all that bonus XP in the game. This was 1,135 base, 2,766 damage dealt, and that gives us a whopping profit of 155,000 credits. Although, do keep in mind that that was with a credit booster on this account, and so still 100,000 credits profit for that game with a premium account, or if we take away the premium account, we would have still made 66,000 credits profit. Now, this is a very nice vehicle, considering that you can get it for free, although you're going to have to spend a long time if you want to get the ha your hands on it. And I very much want to highlight that point, if you have the time to be able to spend on front line. And that's because each stage, at least for me, is probably taking about 10 to 15 hours. And for a, a player who's not getting general more times than they're not, it could be more like 30 hours for every time that you want to prestige. And considering you have to prestige seven times, 210 hours of playing frontline to be able to achieve this tank. Yeah, we're nearly halfway through the year now. If you haven't invested the time already, that's a, that's a big old slog that you're going to have to put in before the end of 2019 if you want to get your hands on this vehicle. So do I think that the tank is worth investing 210 hours into frontline? Well, if you absolutely hate frontline, hell no. It's, it's, it's totally not worth it. There are other heavy tanks in the game that you could pick up, like the Samoa SM or even medium tanks like the Lorraine that I think are going to be even better than this vehicle. However, if you absolutely love your Swedish heavy tanks, you don't really have a choice thinking about it. This is the only premium Swedish tier 8 heavy tank, or the only Swe Swedish premium heavy tank in the game, and if you want to crew train your Kranfang, this is a very strong vehicle. Do I think that the vehicle is outrageously overpowered compared to the standard Emil? No, I, I think that the Emil has a, a few things going for it that are actually better than the Emil 1951, be it the accuracy, be it the fact that the gun's higher up on the turret, which means that you have to expose less of this weak point under here, while the Emil 1951 has the, the point on top of the gun, and also having to expose more of the, the turret armor for high explosive rounds, they kind of hold the tank back from being the pure ridgeline god that the Emil is at tier 9. Sorry, tier 8. Nevertheless, this is an excellent tank, and we're just going to have to wait and see whether Wargaming are going to keep this as a frontline exclusive, because uh, I, I, I think that they'd probably like to have everybody who wants to spend 40 euros uh, give it to them instead of investing a lot of time in frontline, right? Anyway, ladies and gents, boys and girls, that's it for today. Hopefully you enjoyed this one. If you did, give the video a thumbs up. But if you hated it, give the video a thumbs down. And if you're watching this video as it's released on Sunday, it's time for another World of Tanks Tech Tree Showcase right now on twitch.tv forward slash quickie baby. And this week... A lot of you want to see the Leopard 1. I guess because it's been significantly changed, it now has 420 alpha damage. So come along right now as I showcase the entirety of the German lightly armored medium tank tech tree, culminating in a vehicle that at least last patch had the lowest win ratio of any of the tier 10 medium tanks. Let's see if it's been buffed a little bit, right? And if you've never been to one of my Tech Tree showcases before, they're basically like miniature tank reviews, starting from tier 1, working my way up towards tier 10, so you can see if it's a tank line that's maybe of interest to you, or alternatively, if you already have the vehicles, maybe you can pick up a few tips and tricks along the way. So I'm really looking forward to seeing as many of you as possible right now on twitch.tv forward slash quickiebaby, and as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic, and hopefully I'll see you soon.